the Joyful Noise Radio Hour. Well, I could have been a doctor or a lawyer Playing golf with my rich friends at the club But I had to be more stupid Welcome to the Joyful Noise Radio Hour. I am your host, Carl Hofstetter. You just heard the opening title track from the new album, Born Stupid, from Paul Leary of the Butthole Surfers. This is Paul Leary's first solo album in 30 years, and we are super honored to be releasing it in partnership with the legendary Shimmy Disc label. In fact, there's a deeper story here. Um, this is the first proper release from Shimmy Disc since 1998. And in case you're unaware, there are very few record labels as revolutionary as Shimmy Disc. Founded by the producer Kramer, Shimmy Disc was a huge inspiration to JNR, um, especially in their unabashed willingness to embrace such a wide variety of genres. Kramer is someone who discovered and produced artists like Daniel Johnston and Lowe, but he also discovered and released bands like Guar and White Zombie. And he's also a musician himself who has played with everyone from John Zorn to Gigi Allen. Uh, it's really mind-blowing 
the um, the breadth of his musical reach. Anyway, Kramer was the artist in residence at our label in 2020, and that experience sort of naturally led to us partnering with him to reestablish his shimmy disc label. So, check out this Paul Leary album if you are so inclined. It's kind of like a demented children's album. Later this hour, I will be speaking with Dale Grover, who most of you will know as the legendary drummer of The Melvins, who also has a new solo album out on Joyful Noise. We had a great talk about his new album, rat a tat tat as well as the new Melvins album, his writing process, etc. Um, so stick around for that. But up next, I've got three tracks from our diverse roster, some of which might be off-putting to some of you Melvins fans out there. So strap in. You do yoga, work that body, move to the rhythm, the earth is probably not alright. Maybe it is, maybe it's time to get down to biz or chill. It's just free will, lay in the bed, got time to kill. Got some time to build, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't want to be around nobody. Personal space becomes too much, ain't taught to nobody, nobody to trust. Calm down, it's okay to be a person, it's not always searching. Wear a little makeup, sometimes go out, have a little fun, late, late night, blow out. foundation, one whole nation, I like you, don't share my station. Empathy, go on vacation, hook me up with medication. Don't know me, let the robot work. Citizen, got to have a perk Not just culture, teach me vulture We not closer and we like it We type common, get excited Play the game, we been united We all the same, don't even fight it Get your money like a pirate Get your money, become a tyrant Maybe, 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 baby Maybe people are just lazy Be my valentine, I go crazy If I dream like a rich man Would you have me around? Cut my hair like a rich man Take you all around town, 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 town We can go to the premiere you out of your frown Don't you move in a quicksand It brings both of us down, 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 down When the anthem's on, I don't answer the phone Stop what I'm doing around my home I was cooking eggs, the real slow version Eggs got burned, real stiff bourbon I'll let you judge, let you decide Blame everyone we've occupied We're one nation full of pride me, my only friend, and I, and you So how can you argue with the dream? What's your day, what's your regime? What's your day, what's your regime? What makes you take what is your muse? What makes you take what is your muse? There's no way out red, white, and blues no way out red, white, and When the anthem's on, don't answer phones What's your muse, what's your muse? Stop what I'm doing around my home Make it hot, make it hot I was cooking eggs, real long version Dance the bass, dance the bass Eggs got burned, real stiff burn Bass, 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 bass If I dream like a rich man Would you have me around? Cut my hair like a rich man, take you all around town, town, town We can go to the premiere, get you out of your frown Don't you move in the quicksand, brings both of us down, down, down Don't you move in the quicksand, it brings both of us down, down Cut my hair like a rich man, take you all around town, town We can go to the premiere, get you out of your frown Take you all around town, don't you move in the quicksand How can you argue with the dream? Please don't be left in between I talk to my best friend. He's red, white, and blue to the end. Give it the program of forever sad. Please stand tall, it won't be bad. For when you join, dreams do come true. Me, my only friend, and you.
just heard three new songs from Joyful Noise. The first was from the new Serengeti album featuring Greg Sonye from Deerhoof. The album is actually called With Greg from Deerhoof. Um, <laughs> this is the first time these two have collaborated and when we were originally talking with Greg and Getty about this project, they were considering a bunch of different ways to release it. Originally even thinking that it might be a brand new band name. But in the end, they decide to release the project under Serengeti's artist name and have the album title be With Greg from Deerhoof, which I think is fucking brilliant. That's some clever, self-aware nomenclature right there. That track was followed by an early unmastered and unreleased track from the new album by The Ophelias, which will be coming out later this year, but I can't say much more about that right now. And that batch of songs ended with the new track from Dumb Numbers, a project led by our great friend Adam Harding, featuring Murph from Dinosaur Jr. on the drums, and that track was also released in honor of our mutual friend and co-worker Jonathan Lee Horn who passed away from cancer earlier this year. So, in case you're unaware, we've done a series here at the label for the last five years now called the White Label Series. And the idea is that we ask a bunch of notable artists to each choose their favorite unknown band who has never been on vinyl. So this is an artist-curated series in which we basically curate the curators and have zero control over what each curator chooses. (laughs) Past curators of this series include a bunch of notable people like David Lynch and Thurston Moore, Lydia Lunch, St. Vincent, Aesop Rock, Tune Yards, Devander Banhart, Kelly Deal, Doug Marsh, so many more. Our first curator for 2021 is Lily West, also known as La 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 La. And she's chosen this incredible artist, Joshua Virtue. This whole album is rapid pace, but here is a taste of one track, which I will immediately juxtapose with one of the weirdest tracks of the night. An unreleased song from Toshi Kasai's Plan D Project, which features Dave Lombardo on the drums. Dave Lombardo from motherfucking... Slayer. Break a nigga knuckles down. Hit the capital and dip right out the alley with them niggas dice up in the duffel bag. Had you brought the hustle back. God, this is a constant. Put a pause upon your conscience. Got the pauses from the ruffles back. Chip across the shoulder. Battle armor, switch the cup door. Present revolution, 100 years before it's folklore. At you like a fucking sip of praying on these politicians playing God like we would sit inside with no doors. Sit inside with no doors. Starving in the drywall. Clawing at my eyeballs. Tell me that ain't I, y'all. Get the high ball. Life's short. Catch your mind on. Never signed on. Now they force the yard to sign off. Every thought of Mars. Twitter feed like fucking Marrakesh. Light across the grid. Deep as gritted at the pit. Keep the slick shutter. Rods and frog toxins on an arrow. Cancel Fox and CNN, season of the VPN Swear the best is spinning CDs nuts before we see the end Nowadays we breaking out the eyes and doors and now ready Starving in the drywall, clawing at my eyeballs Cultivating fire in the gut with all this time off
Next, I will be talking to the legendary Dale Crover. And I just have to say that if there's one person on planet Earth that has influenced my musical upbringing the most, it is Dale. Uh, it's a real mind fuck to have him now on my label because listening to the Melvins and Nirvana, you know, when I was 12, 13, 14 years old, it formed the pathways in my brain that make me know what good music is now. So hopefully I'm not fanboying out too much during this interview, but uh, you be the judge. Here we go. And I'm recording. All right. Hey. Dale, thank you. Carl. Uh, Th- thanks for having me on Joyful Noise sure. Radio. Thanks for joining. Um, yeah. So, all right. I, I, uh, if I'm being totally honest, like, like you're one of the, the few artists that still sort of, uh, intimidates me. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we we're talk friends all the time. now and like, I, I, I um, it maybe it intimidates be. too strong you, you, of a word, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, Cause I'm so intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're yeah, your personality is so not intimidating, but I just grew up assuming that you were so intimidating and and your your music played such a strong role in in my uh, psyche, you know, that um, that it's I still sometimes have to sort of like pinch myself and be like, you know, Dill Crover's on your label. You know, um, <laughs> well, that's, that's great. You know, maybe I'm uh, maybe my drumming is more intimidating than I am actually yeah. in person. Well, I I think some people probably I think that's why you know because a lot of people are like not a lot of people but some people are always seem kind of yeah a little bit intimidated to meet me scared. because you know I guess because like I've got uh, uh, kind of a scowl. It's just the way my face sits. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, has and Mel- Melvins in general are pretty like menacing most of the time, you know. Musically, yes. Yeah. <laughs> as as humans, no, not right, really. Right. Yeah, but but if your only um, interaction is like, you know, listening to records and seeing seeing you guys live, you know. It, yeah. It'd be scary for someone. Sure. sure. <laughs> but come but, on, we're called the Melvins. How 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 scary can we actually be? <laughs> I know, right? Like that that's one of the things that that's uh so amazing about the Melvins to me though is like um is the sense of humor that you guys still are able to maintain. Like it's able to be this this sort of, you know, dark um uh you know, borderline like evil music at times, but still have this like uh, you know, very palpable sense of humor, you know? Yeah. Or, or, or cute images or whatever. Yeah. Right. Right. Totally. <laughs> Especially with the art. Yeah. Right. The, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's definitely <laughs> op- opposite than what, what you would think when, once you hear the music anyway. Have you guys ever like gotten shit about, about the cutesy art? Like um, in, in, in your past, you know, cause like, I am. I imagine you were sort of one of the first bands to to sort of uh, play with that juxtaposition, right? Of like... Yeah, yeah. When, well, when we were on Boner Records, and I think um, with the Bullhead cover, mm-hmm. you know, we had Bullhead, and then Eggnog. You know, the Bullhead yeah. covers like was was some uh, uh, like old, probably like an old reproduction of like bad fifties wallpaper or something like that, or it was like mm-hmm. a you know tablecloth material or something. Uh, uh, no, for Bullhead. Oh, okay, yeah. The, Bullhead's the fruit? the fruit basket. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and then Eggnog was the one that was wrapping paper. Wrapping paper it was actual yeah. wrapping paper. But uh, Caroline, I think, was distributing Boner Records at the time. And somebody there had told Tom Flynn from Boner, you know, the, if these guys didn't have this, like, <laughs> you know, this, this, these covers, they'd probably sell a lot more records. <laughs> Yeah, that was for us all the more reason to keep you know that we we're on the yes. uh, right track. 
Absolutely. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's one of the things that sets you guys apart. Or it, like the art itself doesn't set you apart necessarily. It's like what that art says about you, you know, musically. It's like the, the fact that you're willing to do that, you know, yeah. to not play by the rules is like an indication that, that, you know, the underlying music is something really fucking unique. Um, yeah. Yeah. That w- maybe we've missed a lot of fans that just look at that and think that we're so, but you know, you know what, like, <laughs> the, but you've probably gained a lot more from people that are like, not specifically, you know, heavy music fans right. Um, right. who are intrigued by it. And I think the right kind of heavy music fan are, is able to sort of look past that, you know, and, and able to see the humor in it and see that it's, it's, you know, it's way more interesting than, than a fucking cannibal corpse cover or something like that, you know? Right. Um, right. Or, you know, not that you guys are, you know, that, <laughs> not that you guys not, are death not, metal, yeah. but, but not, you know not what I mean. cannibal corpse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nothing against nothing, cannibal nothing corpse, but, cannibal but it's corpse. a pretty like typical, you know, it's like typical metal imagery or whatever, you know? Right. You know, and um, the name and stuff like that too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. right. But yeah, but we were all, yeah, we we're always into that kind of music. Uh, just, but yeah, didn't want to have that kind of image i mean you know it, yeah the, ultimately they can't the melvins came out of uh, punk rock and uh, right. i mean even even the name really is kind of like the ramones you know, a take on the ramones or mm-hmm. you know i, I kind of always thought like the stooges or something like that so right i i had a question that i thought of the other day so um like a lot of the the best music in history has come out of like social struggle you know if you're thinking of like blues and like jazz and hip-hop and stuff like do you think do you think that like i mean not to like equate your upbringing with that but do you think that there was some of that sort of struggle in like the aberdeen scene or whatever that played into what the music became or well at least what we were doing um I mean, really, we weren't there for that long, only a few years compared mm-hmm. to how long we, you know, um, I mean, we, we moved to California pretty early on. <laughs> right. But you were uh, raised but, there, but, right? Or, sure. Or right outside of yeah. there? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, uh, both Buzz and I were, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, definitely for me, it's just lucky that I actually found somebody in that area that was thinking differently and doing things doing you know playing original music even i mean um any of the bands in my hometown were just playing covers right like really for the most part you know but i mean I guess weren't you in a, in a like iron maiden cover band originally <laughs> if it were only that cool um, <laughs> was it not exclusively uh, iron maiden or something well i was i was in i was in like a uh a high school cover band, mm-hmm. you know, and I was probably 14, 15 when I joined with these guys. They're a little bit older than me. And that's where the, um, that's where Buzz and our original bass player first saw me was playing with these guys. Mm. Um, but I also played with this other guy who, um, he was this other guy who was older than me. I knew his brother from school, but he played guitar and um he was the one who i i learned of black sabbath from um he was super into sabbath and other heavy metal stuff that i was kind of into i was into more of the heavier stuff than than the cover band guys were for the most part you know i mm-hmm. I, I like judas priest and iron maiden and, and black sabbath and you know those guys liked that stuff a little bit but then also because we were playing high school dances we'd have to play like lover boy covers and, mm-hmm. and just stuff that I, I wasn't into, you know? Yeah. That'd be funny. <laughs> or whatever, you know, tape of that. I know if there only was, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, there, there might I mean, be it's odd someplace. though, <laughs> like that, like you buzz and Kurt Cobain all came out of this tiny, you know, logging town or whatever and it's, yeah it's just no i mean yeah isn't that like, like i mean the yeah. ratio just of like population alone you know is is staggering right right well for even to for uh 
for us even uh, for you know and buzz is the one who kind of knew about punk rock stuff and for mm-hmm. even him to know about that stuff it's like we knew about it from cream magazine and he was probably the one that actually saw those bands and ordered records from like the <clears> sex <throat> pistols and ramones and stuff like that you know and um so just finding somebody that was even into that kind of music yeah is is, is you know in such a small area it's pretty amazing even besides Melvin's and Nirvana, there was um, Metal Church was from that area. Mm-hmm. Who you know those guys? Those guys were on a major, <laughs> and I think uh, one of the Doobie Brothers is actually from that area. Oh, really? That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> was there a point um, when you knew that music was going to be like your career, like the only thing that you did? Yeah, pretty early on, I think. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I felt that way in like sixth grade. Yeah. You know, after seeing Kiss. <laughs> but did you just feel that way or did you sort of like know that you couldn't do anything else? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, it's not that I, I mean, it's not that I, it, it was more that that's what I, you know, that's what you're striving I, it for. It wasn't that I knew I couldn't do anything else. It's that I knew that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, that was, yeah. That, yeah. yeah. And I knew I knew that for sure, pretty strongly. Like this is what I want to do. You know? mm-hmm. Cool. But it, and it was always drums for you. That, pretty, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Cool. For me, like I knew I knew music was what I wanted to do when I was probably eleven. But, yeah. I, but I went through sort of like you know, started with the guitar. You know, went to drums. You know, and and drums was my main instrument and then at at some point and like you know when I was like 19 or whatever I um sort of realized that um my um aptitude was much more um in line with with running a label than with you know that's yeah that's you know that's pretty crazy well that's a pretty early age to like decide that at as well (laughs) yeah yeah it's true yeah um but it was yeah it was a thing where it was still a creative decision for me though it, you yeah. know what i mean it was like it was it was not a financial <laughs> decision it was not a, a career decision it was more like oh, yeah yeah uh, like i realized that i could work with more music on the label side and i could do a better like i could serve you know uh more music i could i could you know uh, touch more music and put it out into the world um, being on the label side than I could as a drummer, you know? Right. Uh, and so that was sort of the impetus for the label for me. But yeah, I still knew sort of, yeah, when I was around 11, I guess. <laughs> yeah, well, that's great. Um, yeah, running, running a label is hard work, <laughs> you know, to decide you're going to do that at that age is, you know, yeah, it's adventurous. It's, uh, yeah. You you were a self starting go getter. I'm 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 honestly like I'm lucky I did it at that age because like start it was um, just a real crapshoot for the first you know five years or whatever and yeah if I you know was a grown up if I had a, a kid or something you know during that time I never would have been able to to do it you know like the reason I I could sort of put all those hours into starting the label early on was because I was, you know, in college and, uh, you know, I could uh, use my student loan money to put out records. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, That's great. And somehow it, it finally, you know, became a sustainable thing. Um, <laughs> I've got kind of, just an open-ended question for you okay like why why do you let us do all this crazy shit with your music (laughs) like like the you know we for for people (laughs) listening you know that might not know like we've done some of the wilder formats um that you know we've ever sort of conceived of with dale's music including like you know multi uh, spindle hole lathe cut records and a a a symbol like a you know record that's also yeah the symbol drum symbol and um it's 
don't get me wrong. I'm delighted that you are uh, always game for our our crazy uh, ideas. Yeah. But, um, well, you guys keep you guys keep asking. You know. <laughs> <laughs> And, do you, and you ever always, have any like hesitation said. when we're when we come to you with these with these fucking wacky ideas? Are you ever like um, like what? Really? Why? You know? No, no. The only one I really kind of like had to think about was doing the Christmas thing because mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I, I just, I just maybe it was just like you know, not having the confidence, thinking I wouldn't be able to pull it off. Yeah. <laughs> that's all but i think the other christmas ones, no, music I, usually I, sucks so it's got like i don't know stigma yeah um well i mean you know not that i wouldn't want to but i don't know it was it just seemed like okay that's going to be a tough one but then i don't know i just because you guys well i mean you know you guys have been great so of course i want to do stuff <laughs> you know so and i'm glad i did that because i thought it came out great um yeah, me but, too. Man. Uh, Thank I, you. I mean, you guys, I don't know. You guys keep asking, and uh, I, I like the, I like your ideas. Do you find them like helpful? And I'm not trying to make, make this like just a leading question. You can be honest with me. <laughs> but do you actually <laughs> find them helpful in sort of like planting the seeds for for like a proper? Oh sure, Good record. Yeah, oh, for a, like a proper release. Well, I mean yeah. that's kind of how it turned out. Yeah, at least, yeah. At least on the first one. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm sure you've you've probably heard me say before that that uh, um, kind of the way that the whole first solo record came about was because of that uh, uh, crazy release yeah. with the six spindle holes and, and, and crazy light cuts. So um, it sold out right away. Right. Which was great. And then but people were like bummed that they couldn't get it. Right. And so that's kind of how the idea of like doing like a regular official release or whatever came about. Yeah. So, and, uh, and I mean, you know, it's something I've kind of thought about before, mm -hmm. you know, like do it, like doing, I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I have to be honest to say that, that um, I have been thinking like, Oh, I could, I could do a solo record, you mm -hmm. know, I'd like to try that. Why not? <laughs> Here's right. Frank. But it was, it was somewhat of a catalyst <laughs> for it. Yeah, totally. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. You know, and then, yeah, and just, I don't know, the idea is to do stuff. And and your guys' interest in, in, in me as well has helped as far as like, yeah, now I want to do more, you know, or even putting together like a solo band and stuff like that, you know. Each little thing that we've done has led up to that and to where we are now with with, uh, yeah. um, with my second record. Second yeah. Second solo record. Yeah. And maybe that's a good segue. Do you want yeah. to um, sure. Do you introduce want to hear a new the song? song? Yeah. yeah. So, I'll never say yeah. is the track. I'll never say. Yeah, I think this was this one came out really good. I was really happy with the way that that uh, that this one came out, um, and I think it's it's one of my favorites for sure um, off this record. You know, um, if not of all time, that I, that I wrote. Um, and uh, yeah, it's called I'll Never Say. Good. 
Versailles. That's right. Such a great track. Thanks. And that is on your new record that just came out called Rat a Tat Tat. That's right. I've got a question about your like writing process. Do you, does your so I mean I know that Buzz writes most of the music for Melvin's or at least like starts the riffs, you know. Um, yes. Do you do you find yourself writing your solo material in a similar way by like starting with a riff or yeah i mean the the song songs you know um yes those for sure are like like that song i mean i had that that's the one that i you know wrote on an acoustic guitar and kept it that way mm -hmm. um, i do a lot of stuff on acoustic just sitting around at home i know buzz does the same thing and a lot of people, I think, do it the same way. You're just sitting around playing guitar and you stumble across something. And and uh, if I like it and and can't figure out that it that it's if I decide it's not something else I've, that I've heard, <laughs> then I'll record it, you know, and um, and if, usually if it's something that's that I like or it, it, I, it sticks out or I keep playing it or whatever, then and it turns into a song eventually. Cool. So that one, like that song right there, I know I had that, the main riff. I mean, I know the, though it's only like a couple of chords, I know I've had that part for a while before I turned the whole thing into a song. So there's a few songs on this new record that are like that, that are actually old, old pieces that I just forgot about that finally just turned them into songs, you know? Um, cool. And it wasn't that I was like, oh, what a, you know, what am I going to do? <laughs> oh, here's something from a billion years ago. It just kind of came up again or whatever. Yeah. How did you remember it? Did you, did you write it down? Do you like write down the tablet or did you like record it, mm -hmm. a little demo on a cassette or something? Well, the one I'm talking about besides this song being old, there's a song on the record called um, kiss proof world. Mm -hmm. And that song, I think that, the main part of that song is as old as like the early or mid nineties. Wow. <laughs> so, and it was just something that I think it's something I did a four track demo of a long time ago and just never finished. And for yeah. whatever reason, I was thinking of more acoustic songs and wanting to do more acoustic songs. And that one kind of came up, you know, it's in D tuning and kind of has a weird pattern to it or whatever. <laughs> and whatever, it just re resurfaced for whatever reason. And it wasn't like I was going back and looking for it because it's old enough but, to where but the I don't riff have. just like came back to your memory. Yeah. Uh -huh. Wow. Cool. Uh -huh. I guess it was that that's, good. That's wild to <laughs> like have that happen after like 30 years, you know? I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's funny because I think uh, a friend of mine who had recorded some four track stuff for a long time ago, I think maybe even found a, a demo version of it. So I haven't heard it, so I don't know, but the, the title sound, sound sounded familiar to me. And I knew that this song was an old one, so. Cool. Weird. <laughs> I wanted to ask a little bit about the like <clears throat> recording trajectory of the Melvins. Um, so it, it seems to me like from my perspective that there, there was this period in, um, I guess late nineties uh with with albums like like stag and um and honky where where you guys seem to be like really using the the recording studio as an instrument yeah if that makes sense yeah and yes yeah and i'm just curious about like what what led to that and then why it seems like since then you guys have primarily been releasing records that that can be played live you know that's like more or less like the what can, life said can or can't can be played live. you know yeah. what i mean like like yeah. your records since then um you know like are more true representations of what you're of what you're playing live you know right As Whereas, opposed to being, like those being, records are yeah. really like you're fucking with the sound in a way where it um like you know, if you do play it live, it sounds totally different, you know? Yeah, um, right. I mean, yeah, well, at that point, we had already made a bunch of records mm -hmm. and 
you know, we were on Atlantic and previously all of our records were on independent labels where we just, we didn't really have money to spend in the studio. Right. And so, you know, Stoner, I'd say Stoner, which, and maybe even part of Houdini. I mean, we, th definitely th th we spent way more time on those records because we had a budget. Mm -hmm. um, Stoner, which we got to record at A&M Studios and we got right. to sit there. We did that record in about three weeks, which was, you know, might as well have been three months for us. Con right. It was considering where we came from. What you were used to. And just being in, in, in like, you know, a studio that had everything you could think of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that's where we started experimenting. Even in the studio, it was big enough to where I had three drum kits set up. You know, I had like a regular yeah. kit set up in the, in the big room for like a rock, rock sound, like for Revolve. That's that drum kit. Mm -hmm. um, across from there, there was um, uh, a, a more experimental drum set that had all kinds of like, you know, weird uh, broken Rip, cymbal ribbon crashers. And, yeah, 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 yeah. And like the opening track on that, Squeetus, uh -huh. that's on Stoner Witch, that's that drum kit. Hmm. And then in a smaller room, I had this, this smaller drum kit that was, uh, you know, more for like a, a, a fast song, like, uh, um, oh, shoot, what's that song called? Uh, um, um, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, oh, dang it. I can't think of, I, I can't think of the song right now. Um, Will, Willie Rollbar. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I pulled that out that, of my that's, I know that that's exactly what I was thinking of. Um, <laughs> cool. So, so, but, so yeah, okay, I get the bigger budgets, uh, allowing you to have more sort of flexibility in the studio, but what about honky? Like, cause that, that was AMREP, right? From the start. It, it was, but then also, uh, um, I during those records, we were working with guys who were really good in the studio, mm -hmm. and we were willing to let them go for it and do, because mm -hmm. like I said, we'd already made a bunch of records. We wanted to do something different, and like you know, Joe Barisi was was one of the guys who who did a great job at mixing and engineering, and then we were working with a, a you know producer at, at that point. Uh, named Garth Richardson and yeah. just those guys their studio knowledge was great and we learned a lot from working with those guys you know and we're totally willing to, to like you know do something crazy and different you know I mean we yeah. I mean in any of the records that we like you know from whatever 60s or 70s you know I mean you know okay the Beatles you know I mean those guys got to experiment and stuff like that. And I really yeah. love that stuff, you know, and we weren't afraid of doing something like that. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. And I, I think that, yeah, I think those records, I don't know that they, like they, they hold a, a, like a special place in my heart just because it's, um, because they did like the the just the sonic quality of them like really like fucked with my head like as a right. young, yeah you know what I mean um, the songs are are there too of course you know but like um, but just the like I don't know the weird shit you guys did you know on on honky with like you know panning like the whole fucking drum kit you know from like left yeah to right slowly and shit like that like really uh you know yeah that one yeah, might have been the most adventurous just because um we committed to ideas and put them on tape rather mm -hmm. you know rather than like like with all the drum sounds and all the effects those the effects were recorded straight to tape you know, there wasn't a lot of mixing involved because we did it as we went along and just decided, okay, you know, this is going to happen. Like even, I think maybe even that moving the drums like that, we knew was going to, was going to happen. You know, right. I planned it out beforehand, you know, that's awesome. So, and yeah, that one was done in, yeah. In six days. Dude. What was the budget for that one? Do you remember? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I mean, I know at the time we kind of, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't big. And, and the time being that um, our time at Atlantic, we thought was going to be over. They hadn't dropped us yet. 
mm. and we thought that if they did, we'd have this record ready to go. But the, and we they, put, and, but they still let you do it. Like so, no, we didn't tell them. <laughs> oh, you didn't tell. Them. <laughs> well, we just recorded it, thinking this is going to be our next record, uh-huh. whether it's going to be on their label or whether it's going to be on Amrap. Oh. And then they heard it and they were like, uh. <laughs> they didn't even hear it. We just, we just, they wanted us to wait, ah. uh, like wait, I don't know, six months or a year to decide whether or not they wanted to do another record. And we kind mm. of forced them to decide right then and there because we didn't want to wait. You know, we right. wanted to keep going. So. What was the, like, how is it different being on a major label um, and an indie? Like, what's, what's the biggest difference? Uh, uh, more people to talk to, I guess, <laughs> and 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 just like, deal with. Um, like bureaucracy. Uh, no, not necessarily. Just, I mean, I guess, you know, rather than rather than talking to one person or, or, or two people, you got you've got um, you know somebody in the art department, somebody you know, and, mm-hmm. and all these. It's just, it's just bigger. <laughs> yeah. You Did know, they more, ever, more people to to deal with? Did Atlantic ever like? Um, going back to the art conversation from before like did Atlantic ever like uh reject your art ideas or like uh think you know did, did they ever like push back on the on the the sort of you know playful nature of the art no and try to get us to change it no mm-hmm. I mean they're into like I mean like Houdini one with Ko- Kozik they were they yeah. liked that um uh with the only thing that they would really be worried about is like getting sued, <laughs> yeah. you know? And so with Stoner Witch, um, the, I think that might even came from some kind of like wallpaper hmm. and, and um, to just make sure that it wasn't any kind of, there would be no issue that just had to be changed quite a bit. <laughs> so they're just being safe, probably yeah. overly cautious. But it wasn't but, like but, in, in a uh, spirit of trying to um, market you or whatever. They were just trying to cover their no, ass. No, I don't think they really ever tried to push anything other than, I mean, we got on to, I think they thought, you know, Headbangers Ball would be the place for us, mm-hmm. you know, which we did get on right away. Yeah, um, I've seen that. And that that first video by, by, uh, you know, by a major label standards was like, it didn't cost anything, you uh-huh. know, was it that was like, market? yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the amount that that video cost probably would be like, you know, um, one meals catering budget for like, uh, <laughs> right. Beyonce video or something, you know, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> what a weird time. Like when, when videos were the the thing, were like the marketing tool for a record. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, and the amount of money that got spent on them, I know yeah, it's just right? got to be like, millions, millions and millions. Gosh. You know, I mean, nothing compared to like movie standards, but you know, thinking about it now, it's like man, people spent a lot of money. Yeah, <laughs> and I know we got better and, tools now, so we can you know do more with less, but like. Yeah, yeah, you know, like we got to make that. To Even today, when I see, you know, friends' bands or, or, you know, labels that we're friends with spend, you know, whatever, 20 grand, 30 grand or whatever on a video, I'm like, God damn, dude. Like, how are you going to make that money back? Like, how in, yeah. in the world is that financially feasible in this day and age, you know? And I don't think it is. <laughs> Ever. No, I think it's like and, a and especially uh, knowing what the, what we know now is that we can kind something. of do it ourselves. I know? know it's way like it's it's way more practical to do it yourself. You know, um, I mean that's what most of our artists do, or you know, or or some you know variation of that where they have you know a, a friend who's a you know videographer. Yeah, right? and you know, yeah, they, they help them out, and it costs you know two grand. Um, exactly yeah so otherwise i mean and well of course there really isn't any kind of mtv anymore you know yeah that i feel like that like the music portion of mtv ended before it needed to it seems you know what i mean like they transitioned to like all reality shows before people were ready 
or before I was yeah. married, at least. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Like they still had a, a, the audience. It's not like the audience was dwindling. You know what I mean? Like, but for some, for whatever reason, you know, the fucking bean counters decided it was better to uh, or more profitable to do reality stuff. And then, right? Yeah, and that changed everything. And then you know digital was the next big shift and then streaming after that <laughs> right we're lucky as a label i think in that like we, we uh avoided all that shit like we we grew after like the digital you know after napster shit or whatever after the you know right could just be shared endlessly and so we never really like knew what the what the fucking you know glory days were like and uh yeah i always think of us as like a post-apocalyptic record label. Yeah. we're like we're like the fucking roaches that survived you know yeah well but then people it seems like people care about vinyl now too yeah more than they did <laughs> they do and I, and I think that but i think like mark uh, like vinyl's like a marketing tool almost you know as much as it is a listening format it's like it's a way for people to care about your record like if you do yeah. art well and if you you know you do you know crazy shit like the 12-sided record or whatever you know <laughs> people um will pay a premium for it and really cherish those things um yeah but, but it's well like it's a piece of art you know exactly it's a it's a it's a representative piece of art but it's not like it's not a practical listening format you know <laughs> i think that 12-sided record is like literally like the most impractical record ever made yeah but it, yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh man I, you know it's kind of a toss-up between that one and the metal one it's like okay <laughs> this one will probably destroy your needle this one yeah. might not <laughs> but, uh, i wonder how many people actually you know had the balls to put put the needle down on that metal it does work i mean it, oh, yeah it works. It does. i mean you know, I, works. I do it but i don't you know i don't <laughs> have great turntables <laughs> yeah i know yeah, just get a special turntable for it <laughs> yeah buy a crosley just for that the crosley's cheaper than the record <laughs> <laughs> yeah probably so <laughs> it is. You can get a crosley for like 40 bucks <laughs> um all right so do you ever go back and listen to old Melvin's records? Um, sometimes, but uh, I mean, <clears throat> it it but no, not recently. Yeah. That like there there are there are a few songs that I hear you guys play um, pretty routinely live that yeah i think have become like other versions of those songs you know what i mean like uh lovely butterfly is probably the best example but like skin horse like pearl bomb um i don't know there i'm sure there are others but it, but it seems like you know you guys recorded this version and i think this happens with a lot of bands you know but like you record the version in the studio and then it sort of evolves as you're on tour you know oh yeah before you know it it's sort of a different version of the song and that, yeah I I usually if i go know, back and like if you ever go back and listen to the original recorded versions or if or if it's like you prefer to leave that in the past no i mean or i'll hear something that's that's I'll hear some song and go, oh, wow, we're playing it way faster now, <laughs> yeah. you know, or, 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 yeah, or we're playing it wrong and <laughs> just didn't, don't realize it, uh -huh. you know. <laughs> and, um, and then in those cases, you just leave it, like, let it be? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. you know, or even, even if it's a song that, like, we'll, you know, we're having to teach, like, a, a bass player that hasn't played one before, um, I mean, we'll, we'll, usually i mean he can go back and listen to it if he wants to but usually we'll just let them come up with their own version of it you know and we'll we'll show them how it goes or how at least we think it goes and just tell them to play it you know play it something like this 
<laughs> so, oh. but yeah, so sometimes if we go back, yeah, we'll realize like, oh, we're, oh, we're not playing that right, but oh, well, you know, I guess it doesn't yeah. really matter. I yeah. love, I love that. I love your, um, sort of like willingness to let the songs evolve, you know? Yeah. Um, it, it, the, so yeah, that um, kind of gets me to another question, which is like the Melvins have obviously had a lot of bass players, and um, I'm curious, like how, like how quickly do you know if a bass player is the right fit? You know, like does it click immediately, or is it the kind uh, of thing where you have to feel it out, like through several rehearsals and listen back I'm, you know i mean for the most part anybody that we've picked like say you know kevin from the cows like we liked yeah. his bass playing and it was never really like trying a, a, a tryout or anything like yeah. that not an I audition mean, or... we just kind of just said oh we want you to do this you know i mean um maybe the only time we really did something like that was like with the big business guys and mm -hmm. maybe just because it was like that was actually something quite different though. Right. We had done it before playing with, you know, it was just like, okay, this is really something different uh, playing with two drummers, yeah. you know, but I mean, it, it was like within playing half of the first song with those guys, that was, you know, evident that it was going to work. No problem. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. Um, you know, um, but yeah, but otherwise like, yeah, with, with, I mean, you know, any, anybody like, you know, like with Pincus or, or Steve McDonald, I mean, you know, all those guys we thought were good to begin with. And, you know, we wanted to play with them because they liked what they did. Yeah. So, so yeah, never really any tryouts really. That's uh -uh. cool. I, yeah. You have, you have good instincts then. <laughs> yeah i mean yeah it's worked i mean it seems like we've had a lot of bass players but i mean considering how long we've been doing this you know i mean right. you have a business how many employees have you gone through you know, I know right <laughs> i know and it's like fine you know it, it it takes a while to uh find the right ones you know <laughs> sure even, or sometimes just the right ones only can only stick around for so long right or things you know? just don't work out for whatever reason you know? right so what's it like being so so on this new Melvin's record? It's you know back to the uh, 1983. Uh, uh, yeah. Right. So so you're playing bass on this record. I'm playing bass. Yes. And, it, is um, that a like a fun transition? Yeah, I mean I I like playing bass. It's um you know I mean I'm trying to think. I mean I guess I've played bass for a long time. I mean I even played bass on on. Um, a couple of songs on a Houdini, you know, so, um, and I played guitar for a long time. So it's just like, I don't know. It, and bass is also a rhythm instrument. So it, it you know, seems yeah. logical enough that I can do it. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's fun to play. And I mean, this came about, I mean, the, the, this version of the band started playing originally because of Jello Biafra's 50th birthday party. Huh. We got back together with with uh, Mike Dillard, the original drummer, and um, and did uh, like like their first demo, basically, their first demo worth of songs. And uh, when we we're when we first got together together and did it, uh, it was super fun. And um, I think Buzz was like, "Oh, we should just make this a version of the band and write new songs," you know, ha ha. <laughs> Which <laughs> yeah, a lot of our ideas always start with some, you know. Right. With some kind of kind of half half joke, half seriousness. Yeah. And and so this is our second record, actually, with this lineup. Yeah. Second record of new songs. So was Jello yeah. like a fan of that original demo or something? Like what, what what's the connection to him? Yeah. You know what? He actually had before we started working with him. See, Jello keeps everything. He'll, mm -hmm. he'll keep every if He's somebody gives him a record, he still has it. Hmm. You know, I don't know if Hoarder, I mean, just, yeah, Hoarder Collector, I guess, you know, but just like, you know, if somebody gives him a record or a demo or a t-shirt, he he doesn't get rid of it. And he had from probably maybe even before I was in the band, I mean, I know he had the, the tape of the original, the original demo tape with Mike playing drums on it and Matt on bass. Oh. And he he had that and like, 
I think a friend of theirs had sent it to him and he had like, you know, whatever the letter that it came in and everything that he still had. Oh, that's awesome. And so did you so, guys sent it to him as like a demo? Hey, did, yeah. did you know him at the time? No, a friend, a friend knew him. Hmm. And, you know, it was probably back when, yeah, they were probably looking for somebody to, that wanted to put out records. Yeah. You know, wow. um, that's awesome. And, you know, he, uh, I believe that Jello put out the vinyl of the, of the what became the Mangled Demos, which was the early Melvin's demo tapes. And so that's why we ended up playing that show. And um, and then, yeah, and then since then, now, now this is our, our second record. <laughs> Hell yeah. And, um, so you, you know, the songs, are, the songs are a bit more simple, I guess, than maybe uh, modern era Melvin's. Right. You know? it, yeah, keeping in spirit like, with the with the original version of the band. You right. Know, they're four yeah, four. A little more like uh childish or something. <laughs> Not, yeah. In a uh, derogatory way. Juvenile. Yeah. <laughs> childish childish and juvenile. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know. It's almost I think they're really catchy. Yeah. You know, like mm -hmm. I, I do find myself humming some 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 of them quite often. Um but um so yeah, do you want to hear this song from the <clears> new record? Yeah. It's um, so this song I can tell you um, is it's um, uh, co-written by myself and and Buzz, which there's only been a couple. One of the other ones is the bit, and so um, with both of both songs, this one included, I did the uh, um, music and he wrote the words, and um, oh. this one, this one, uh, um, yeah. Yeah, he asked me to write a song for the record. He's like, come up with something. I'm like, okay, I've got this riff. It's perfect. And it's called Brian the Horse Face Goon. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i'm um endlessly inspired by melvin's man what one of my uh best friends once uh said something years ago that that really stuck with me and it was 
to the effect of at least we know no matter how bad it gets, the Melvins will still come out with an album this year. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Hey, and then, yeah. And then it's happening. Another record. Yeah. 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 It should be out any second. And, and, you know, if if it's not out already. Yeah. Um, I think it will be out by the time this airs. And, you know, there's, there'll be more stuff too. Probably, you know, hopefully before the end of the year. Yeah. So, um, I wanted, (laughs) I would kind of be remiss if I didn't like bring this up, but like, so the, I don't know if I've ever said this to you like in person, but, um, I think more than any other artist, your work has, has sort of, um, formed the pathways in my brain that tell me what good music is you know wow. <laughs> like you got you got to me Excellent. early you know what i mean and and it like uh yeah so like so yeah. there there are specific moments you know of like or you know 90s melvins that that like that really um you know turn my brain inside out you know and Very so cool. I wanted to play like one little segment of the song Goggles, you know, from from Stag and just see if sure. you like, remember writing this drum part. OK, so let me play it. So <laughs> that's the part that uh, that fucked up fourteen uh, year old Carl's brain. Uh, oh, right on. Yeah, you know, I, I I'm trying to think. I like we were playing that song, I believe, before we recorded it. But yeah, and then I don't know what the hell we were doing. Like we, <laughs> someplace there's a demo of that too. That that's pretty good. Um, yeah. It. But not so to me. Like I just couldn't like it was like the long the long form like pattern you know that that you were doing and the prominence of of the hi-hat in in this like super chaotic you know yeah like (laughs) making the hi-hat be this like um it's almost like it's like sending a signal you know what i mean like that's how it felt we, to yeah me. Like, i i remember that we worked hard on that mix yeah <laughs> it sounds it does, like it no i mean it, like it's, i mean it, it's i know like, to an untrained ear it probably sounds like a lot of noise but it's like no no man like that shit is dialed in i think it was because we had felt like We'd certainly done songs in that style before, and but we didn't want it to sound typical. Com- mm-hmm. I mean, we didn't want it. We didn't want it to sound like other stuff that we did. I guess you know. I mean, we'd done like slow, heavy, you know, grinding stuff. But to like you know, like for whatever reason, we decided that yeah, the hi hat should be the loudest thing in the mix. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> but it's, adventurous. It's not just yeah. that it's the loudest thing; it's that it's doing this really interesting pattern, you know? Yeah. Um, right, right. That kind of holds it all together, and you know that that's usually the the thing that people forget about. You know, that's usually the the um, you know the 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 sort of uh, 
piece of the drone kit that's like in between things you know what i mean right yeah 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 um, yeah man uh i don't know what else to say about that <laughs> i just think that's like to this day i kind of i kind of remember things about it but it's been a long time yeah <laughs> for sure right, you yeah. know i you mean guys, i remember this you know uh i've never seen you guys play that live have you used to i know we did i know that yeah. we used to but it's been a long time and all i could think of too is that we we had just come off the white zombie tour and we're wanting to do something pretty ferocious mm -hmm. <laughs> right on man well as you know we are um at joyful noise we are helping to revive the shimmy disc record label and that's uh, right and the first um release that's coming out is uh, called Born Stupid from Paul Leary of Butthole Surfers, who you have collaborated with. Is, is yes. Hold It In the only time you guys have actually recorded together? Yes. Cool. Yes. And uh, yeah, that was a real a real treat for us. Uh, we had been playing with Jeff for a while. Yeah. And Oh, before um, that record? Before Hold It In, yeah. Um, well, at least Jeff had, you know, done some touring with us um, filling in for Jared when Jared was kind of on maternity leave. And we just thought, yeah, you know, we, we wanted to work with Paul for a long time um, and liked records. Well, not only, uh, you know, all the bottle surfer stuff, um, but stuff he had produced as well. We were fans of and thought it'd be really fun to work with him. Yeah. Um, and had kind of talked to him a little bit about it before, but then, since we've been playing with Jeff, we asked like, well, what do you think if he would want to play with us and help do a record? And so that's kind of how that came about. Um, Did he, um, and then step into a production role at all with that record or was it just playing? I mean, definitely. I, I would say he was producer on his songs for sure. You know, like we went to his house and worked on them and he was definitely in charge, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was great. That was really fun. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, but we'd always have to be done by uh, Judge Judy time, you know. Three thirty rolled around. We had to, well, at least take a break. You know? yeah. Judge Judy. He's a, he, no. Yeah, huge, huge Judge Judy fan. Has wow. it even has a, uh, a autographed uh, picture in one of his little bathrooms off off the studio. That's a <laughs> random factoid, man. Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and so. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and I think even the the record title came from <laughs> him talking about uh, um, getting really bad farts when he had, was doing acid, <laughs> and he had to hold he had to hold it in. <laughs> yeah. oh, so that's where that came from. It's... But uh, yeah, I, I heard this new record of his, and I really think it's great. Yeah, you know, it's, um, it, it's kind of like a, a children's records for adults. Yeah, that's a good way. To it. <laughs> yeah, it's and, like a demented children's record. Yeah, and I, I love the uh, uh, the revisited butthole surfer songs that are on there. Yeah, um, and definitely this one that we're gonna play here is one of my favorite butthole surfer songs. You know about yeah. uh, the singer from the Dicks, or at least the title is <laughs> Gary Floyd. Yeah. <laughs> Gary Floyd's gonna come on down. <laughs> gonna bring his friends. <laughs> Love it. That's really good. Right on, man. Well, um, yeah, we'll uh we'll end on that. Is there anything else you want to talk about while we're here? Um man, just looking forward to being able to uh get on with life once once yeah, we're man. we're through this whole pandemic thing and hopefully uh get back out on the road yeah. and do more can, music and can we, can we look forward yeah. to like go cover band touring yeah i'd really like to do that you no know, i've never seen you guys live as dale cover band and that's because yeah. <laughs> you've only played like you know five shows or something on the west coast and i wasn't able to make it yeah, yeah. well yeah i, think I, I know <laughs> I think I had a newborn at the time or something. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I, that's a pretty good excuse. Yeah. So, but I mean, yes, I really want to get this thing going and, and, and yeah. do some stuff. Can't wait. Do some shows. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. 
Um, well, um, thanks so much. Thanks for your interest. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for all your interest in me, Carl. You know, without I, this, none, of, none of this would have happened. It's, uh, it's, it's absolutely my pleasure, man. I, 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 like I said, I still keep, um, sort of pinching myself trying to wake up, um, <laughs> from the, the dream where Dale Crover is, uh, you know, collaborating with me on fucking records. So, uh, it's awesome. Uh, Let's keep it going. <laughs> I'm honored. No, of course, man. Thanks so much, dude. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Here's Paul Leary with Gary Floyd Revisited. I could have a real good time if I had a gun I know. I do and say And if I didn't have no gun I know I've got a knife Gary Floyd and all his pals Gonna come on down Gary Floyd and all his pals Gonna come on down Joyful Noise Radio Hour. Wait, wait, wait. Was there a moment where your daughter was becoming interested in Nirvana and then realized that you played in Nirvana? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then she started asking questions, you know. (laughs) But what was cool is I got to take her... Like... uh, uh, in Seattle, there's a museum there that, that has a Nirvana exhibit. Uh-huh. And so, and then it talks about me and there's even stuff with me. Like, Dad, that's you. What? Yeah. yeah, I mean, but, and then she also knew about, I mean, 
you know, she grew up with me being in the Melvins, but you know, then yeah, you know, finding the relation and all that stuff was pretty cool. So, so she discovered Nirvana on her own and then yeah. that you were <laughs> a drummer. Yeah. But she honestly likes that, you know, she likes the music. Yeah. She, she listens to pretty cool stuff. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so <laughs> man, that's wild.